Hi, this is Catherine Carney Feldman from the Ipswich Conservation Commission. And today's video is a special video on a very unique environment called a vernal pool. We'll be talking about a vernal pool and why it's so important to our ecosystem. But we're also going to be talking equally about how important the environment is surrounding the vernal pool. To help me do that, I need a specialist, someone that has an awful lot of information, not only about vernal pools and their environment, but by the, about the creatures that live in them as well. So today we have to help us do that, Mike DeRosa of DeRosa Environmental Consultants. Hi, Mike. Hi, Catherine. How are you today? I am fine. So we're going to start with the really big question. What is a vernal pool? Well, vernal pool is a shallow depression in the landscape that holds water for a certain time of the year. And that period is called the hydro period. And typically, vernal pools have a fairly short hydro period, two to three months, and then they dry up in the fall. And that's essentially what a vernal pool is, a short-lived period of ponded water. What season is our vernal pool in? Yeah, it's, it's in the spring. So vernal re refers to the uh, springtime of the year. And why is a vernal pool so important, Mike? Well, it's important to a variety of, of different uh, species that have evolved over millennia to breed in these pools as a predator avoidance um, uh, tactic, predator avoidance adaptation. Um, these species uh, migrate to the vernal pool, the same vernal pool, uh, every year. And they're hardwired to come to these particular sites where they were born and where they emerged. And, um, and they, they breed, lay their eggs, and then they leave the pool and go back into the upland areas for the rest of the year. So what are some of the more famous and known species that have evolved over millions or maybe hundreds of thousands of years to be able to do this? What, what are those species? The common ones here are, are a couple of mole, mole salamanders. One, the yellow-spotted salamander. The other is the blue-spotted salamander, which is um, endangered in, in our neck of the woods here. Wood frogs are also common. Um, there are several turtles that utilize vernal pool habitat. Landings turtle is one, another endangered species. Um, so a number of different different ones. The common one that everybody hears is the peepers in the uh, early spring. The spring peepers. Spring peepers, deafening, deafening. Hello, everybody. How are you today? Good. My name is Catherine Carney Feldman, and like you, I live in Ipswich. Also, like you, I love vernal pools. In fact, I love them so much, I'm making a video on them. And the reason I'm making the video is that there's lots of boys and girls, not you, but there's lots of boys and girls, and there's also a lot of adults that really don't know what a vernal pool is and why it's so important. So I'm wondering, would you all like to help me today make a video on a vernal pool and explain to people what it is? Yeah. Great. I think one of the best ways we can do it to start is by asking some very, very basic questions. Okay, the most basic question I can think of is what is a vernal pool? I'm going to start right here. Hi. Would you like to explain what a vernal pool is? Um, a vernal pool is a, it's a pool that dries up in the summer and it freezes in the winter. There is no fish. And many animals will be there. Excellent. Does anybody else have a little more to say about what a vernal pool is? Why do we call it vernal pool? It's a vernal pool because when it dries in summer, it is then replaced by rainfill, and s and in the and in spring, the s when the snow melts, the snow goes into it and it is filled up by snow melt. I think I heard a key word here, and the word was spring. The word vernal means spring, doesn't it? In many languages. And this is the whole story. We're studying a pool that specifically is very important in spring. Now, can anybody tell me what the difference between a vernal pool is and a regular pool? 
Well, a regular pool can be a pond or the or a swimming pool, and a vernal pool dries up in the summer, like Heather said, um, and it fills up in fall, and animals come in to lay eggs, and then in the spring they all hatch. And what is missing in a vernal pool that sometimes you might find it in another pool or in another pond? Fish. Very, very good. What else can we say about vernal pools? What are some of the animals that absolutely need a vernal pool so that they can survive? Frogs and salamanders. Do we have any other? Fairy shrimp. Fairy shrimp. Anything else? Are those the main ones? Great. Can somebody explain to me why it's so important for those animals to have a vernal pool? Someone that hasn't had a chance to say anything yet? Okay, over here. Well, they breed and they lay their eggs in near the pool and by the pool. Do they live there all year round, all these animals? Does anybody know where they come from? Well, a lot of them, they either burrow into the ground um, w in the winter because the pool freezes. Um, the wood frog actually passes an antifreeze over its body and um, the it freezes, its whole body freezes, its heart stops beating. Um, it could be for a couple days or a couple weeks. Excellent. Now we're getting into some very good specifics. Can somebody tell me where those animals are coming from when they're not in the vernal pool? Do they live in Rhode Island or maybe they do they live in South Hamilton, um, Boston? Where are they coming from? Would you like to start? Um, they live in the uplands around the vernal pool. Another great word. What does that word uplands mean? The area, the elevated areas around the vernal pool. Excellent. Is there anything else that we want to tell our viewing audience about a vernal pool before we go out and see one today? Vernal pools make good bre breeding grounds for, for young, like tadpoles, to grow up because there's no fish to eat the eggs and the young tadpoles. Excellent. Any other little points that we might want to get on the video? There are also very small organisms that you can't that you can just barely see with the naked eye. Great. Well, I think we're off to a great start. I want to thank your teacher, Mrs. Manzi, for allowing me to come today. And also, we have in the audience with us as well Mike DeRosa of DeRosa Environmental Consultants. And we're going to go outside. We're going to see a vernal pool today. I have a feeling the pool's probably going to be in a solid state of ice, but we're going to get a chance to see in the winter what a vernal pool is, and Mike's going to ask a few other questions when we're outside. Would you like to come outside today and have a nice adventure? Great. Well, let's go along. Hello, I'm Lisa Manzi, and I'm a fifth grade teacher at Joyon School here. And behind me is about half of my class, fifth graders. And we have walked out to Vernal Pool that's pretty much right in our backyard. It's on Willowdale State Forest property, but right behind Joyon School. And it's a pool that we study all year long. There are other pools in the woods that we look at too, but we study vernal pools year round to see how they change and we study the creatures here and why they're important, why vernal pools are important and why um, the surrounding area is important. So we're out here today, it's February 29th and we've come out to see if the vernal pools are ready for spring migration of the sal uh, spotted salamanders and the wood frogs. So we've come out to check conditions to see if things are ready for migration. And you might be able to tell there's a little snow in the air, so that may impact uh, whether or not things are ready. Okay, so we've come out today to look at the vernal pool and talk about whether or not on February 29th it looks like things are ready for migration. So I want you to think about what we've learned about what are the characteristics, what needs to happen before amphibian migration can occur in spring and 
Who has something looking around at the uplands, at the vernal pool? Who has something they want to say about whether or not you think conditions are right? Well, since the, s the ice is mostly melted on the pool, that would be one side that it could be ready. Okay. All right. Who else has something to say? All right. Mackenzie? Well, how it feels to me right now, I feel the weather isn't quite ready because obviously it's snowing and it's pretty cold, but I look from looking around, I would think it's ready. Okay. Who else has something they want to say? Something you notice? Anything you notice? Ben? Uh, well, there's a lot of leaf litter around, so if they would like to come out, they, uh, they wouldn't be seen by any predators or anything. Okay. Look around. Look around at the uplands right now. We've talked about sort of what needs to be true about uplands before migration happens. What do you think? Based on the way it looks right now. Sarah? Well, um, Hold on, honey. Go ahead. A little louder. To add on to what Aaron said, yeah, wood frogs, uh, if it, when they feel snow, that's when they go into the freezing state. So if there's still snow, they won't unfreeze. Okay. If we wanted to look around and see if we noticed wood frogs, where would we look? Where would you look to see? And what might they look like when it's cold? Heather? You would look under the leaf litter since they overwinter in the leaf litter. And, they, and since they are in a frozen state right now, they would probably look like a rock at first sight, but if you look closer, you would be able to see that it was a frozen frog. Big night, as it's come to be known, is the first night of the mass migration of amphibians from their upland habitat to their spring breeding habitat in the vernal pool. Vernal pool is where they mate and lay their eggs, and big night usually happens in the night of the first warm rains in the springtime after the ground has frozen from the winter cold. Okay, so <laughs> Oh, there's one. I see him. I see him. I see him. That's the one. Right, have we got it? I'm going to zoom in on him now. She's right on it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. There you go. Oh. Did you get it, Mike? There's yeah, another one. I, I did. Where? Right, right there. there, Mike. Look at that one. I got it. That's it. Keep on him. Keep on him. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. Oh, that's nice footage. Another one. Look at this. One second. God, look at that. That is beautiful. That's the best. One second. Got. Stay on him. Stay on him. Don't, don't, don't go anywhere. You guys see this stick. There, goes. there we go. There we go. Everybody, put your light on. You can just see a second. During the mass migration of big nights, keep in mind you are not the only one using the road to get from one place to another. Amphibians need different environmental clues that will tell them when it is time for them to do their mass migration from their upland habitat to the vernal pool. And those clues are very important as to signals when they should do that. And th uh, they're also very limited as to what season they can do that in. Michael, explain. The, um, the migratory um, amphibians that use vernal pools rely on a number of environmental cues to, to trigger the, the migration initially. Um, first and foremost is photo period, the length of day. As the length of day starts to get longer, um, they utilize that information to 
to time their migration to the pools along with moisture they need moisture in the evening in the in the darkness of evening to avoid predators um, and to access the pools uh, under cover of darkness and then the other is uh, in moisture they need the rain they're amphibians they need the moisture to, to respirate and to to operate and so they're they're moving in the early early spring at night um, when it's raining and, and those are really the cues that they're looking for. Here we are standing in front of another vernal pool and we're at Dow Brook and we have in the pool around us lots of egg masses. Um, at this point we basically have the spotted salamander egg masses because the wood frog egg masses have already um, developed and the wood frogs have already taken off. And in Mike's hand right here, we see the yellow spotted salamander eggs. Yeah, this year was a uh, early year for wood frogs. They laid eggs, hatched and developed within about a two week period. The water temperature had gotten so warm that they just uh, they modified their growth rate and uh, developed very quickly. These are yellow spotted salamanders, which are partially developed. You can see the uh, the uh, the larvae in there developing. Sometimes you'll see them twitch, but uh, these will hatch probably another week or two, another week, and um, may have been laid by um, that adult yellow spotted that we saw up in the woods, or cousin, or cousin. Um, so very, uh, very interesting stuff. There is enough water here. This is a deeper pool, so these stand a pretty good chance of, uh, of actually emerging and surviving. And we were talking earlier about the fact that salamander and all the amphibians that actually reproduce and use vernal ponds, um, actually have to do it quite quickly, and that's because vernal pools tend to dry up quickly. And we were talking possibly about the fact that sometimes they even speed up the process if they see that the water is disappearing faster. And R would that be the case this year? Yeah, certainly that was the case this year with wood frogs. The uh, water temperature in the early spring was, I mean, we had air temperatures in the 80s. And you just told me a couple minutes ago it's going to be 80 again on Monday. It's only April. So, um, yeah, it's definitely having an effect this year. It's a very unique year. Um, and this, this sort of is interesting too because these vernal pool species, the salamanders in particular, are long lived. They, um, they'll live 20 years, 25 years. And this whole strategy of predator avoidance by using these vernal pools um, has evolved for predator avoidance, but it's also evolved so that it's a very patchy environment, it's a very unpredictable environment. One year we'll have water that's deep and that's successful. We'll have successful hatches and, and, um, and young. And then uh, other years like this, I think a lot of the pools are just dry right now and there's going to be zero production. So what they've done is evolved to live longer so that they can produce um, more young over that lifespan and so the population stays stable. So just like all of nature, you could have a mast year for amphibians as you would have a mast year for trees and you can have other years where you don't have a high reproduction rate and that's where we see the population dip. Luckily the salamander have such long lived um, lives and um, over a 20 year period can reproduce on hopefully good years and um, knowing that they'd probably have to cut back on some other years. One thing, too, we wanted to mention is that the difference between the egg masses, the wood frog egg masses have just a single membrane. And if you look closely here, and we'll try to get a better shot of it, you can actually see two membranes. So there's an outer membrane that's sort of, it's like this jelly um, material, gelatinous material. And then the eggs are individual within that gelatinous material. So there's actually two membranes. Um, protecting these guys. 
and you can see how it's become discolored. They're very clear when they're initially laid, and then um, they become discolored with algae, which is actually a cryptic uh, coloration, so it protects them from predators further. Actually, it's the color of pond water, so it's very hard to see, unless, of course, we're looking very carefully. But for a predator, where it's the same color as the pond water, it would be harder for a predator to actually find when it's this color. Exactly. So, Catherine, one of the one of the areas that they're using in the non-breeding season is the upland woodland areas surrounding the pools, and they they live, you know, pretty much what's called semi-fossorial. They're below the ground, so they're using uh, mice trails and vole trails. They're under logs. They're under under rocks, under debris, and whenever. I'm in and around vernal pools. I'm always turning over logs, turning over things, looking for stuff. So let's see if there's anything under here. This is a good example of habitat that they'd be using. Oh, we struck pay dirt. We've got, is that, what type, is it yellow spotted? So it's a yellow spotted salamander here, and you can see how they're using the mouse, mice the trails. Mouse trails. And Maybe there's a red back right, right oh, next at, to it. Look them. at that, oh my God. Okay, so we have our yellow spotted salamander. Ambistoma maculatum. And this is where they're, they're spending their non-breeding season. So about 10 months of the year, they're looking for protection. Yep. They're looking to stay away from their predators. You can see why they'd be so vulnerable. Yep. What and are some of the animals that would be eating? They're nocturnal, you know, they're nocturnal. They're out scavenging around at night right. on rainy nights. And so this one but is deep, deeply under, sleeping. They're they're under under logs, uh -huh. staying out of harm's way. What type of animals would be eating the salamanders? Well, any sort of foraging, uh, you know, raccoons, including birds. We've got I'm birds. I'm sure birds. Mm -hmm. Skunks. Yep. Any omnivores out there? Vernal pools are a unique and rare form of wetlands. They are inhabited by several species of wildlife that are dependent on them for their survival. Without vernal pools, we would no longer have salamander, wood frogs, and other amphibians and invertebrates, which can only successfully breed in these often temporary bodies of water that are not colonized by fish. They are a rare and small gem in the world of water resources that define our local environment and make it a home for such diverse and interesting wildlife. It is up to us to be good stewards. We need to educate ourselves and our children about this unique environment and then with understanding protect it so it can continue to add its uniqueness in this diverse and wondrous world we live in. Okay. A rainy night in Georgia A rainy night in Georgia Lord, I believe raining all over the world I feel like it's raining all over 